evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mound Science and Energy Museum Association Seminar Series. My name is Bob Bowman. I'm one of the directors of our uh, association. And tonight, we are continuing with a, uh, a published author. His name is Andrew Walsh. And he gave a, has written a book on Lost State in Ohio. And so hopefully he's going to find it. And without a lot further ado, here's Andrew. Well, thanks so much for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me here to speak. Um, yeah, I, I think it's always great to, to get to speak in uh, places around town with, with some historical significance, so I think it's a, a really cool museum here, um, and I think that's just a really uh, staple of our area, that we have so many cool museums that I think a lot of locals don't know about, so uh, I think we've got to keep spreading the word on um, some gems like this, but as you have heard, my book um, is called Lost Date in Ohio, so in this talk I'm going to share a few sites uh, taken from that book. We'll look at a few old images and maps, and I'll do some comparisons to, to current day uh, views of some of those sites. Um, and then as we go along, um, I'll, I'll leave some time for questions at the end. So if you have uh, some things you're more curious about or, or a story to share or something, we'll, we'll make sure we have some room for that. So to get started, um, just to cover a little bit of, of the types of, of lost Dayton, um, you know, what that concept means as far as what I research, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, individual buildings, companies, even whole neighborhoods um, that have vanished over the years for a variety of reasons. So from my um, book's cover, uh, that's one example of that kind of first category of just the great individual building that is now lost. So some of you may have recognized that as Steel High School. Um, so that is, in my opinion, um, as someone who's not native to Dayton, and I'll, I'll say a little more about my own background um, as we go along, but Steele High School, with its look of a castle, um, really is, is, in my opinion, one of the, the best individual buildings that was lost. And as is the case with most of downtown, um, and a recurring theme in my book, since I cover mostly downtown and, and adjacent areas, um, Steele was badly damaged during the Great Flood of 1913. Um, and that started it on a decline, which eventually resulted in its demolition in 1955. So another iconic lost individual building is one that I take some personal interest in because I'm a librarian for my day job, so I work at Sinclair Community College. Um, and this great building, of course, is the um, Romanesque Revival style public library that was built in Cooper Park in 1888. And I, I got really into kind of the Dayton library history at one point, and one thing that stood out to me is that Dayton was the first city in Ohio to incorporate a public library, which it did in its very first year of existence, 1805. Um, but at the time, the library and its services were a little bit different from what we'd expect today. Um, one source called it the uh, two well-filled bookcases in one of the pioneer cabins. So, um, so there's a long history, but it's definitely grown since then. Um, when this building was built, it um, was constructed in Cooper Park, right in the center of downtown, which itself has a pretty interesting history in that it was um, planned green space right in the center of the original town plan. Um, and at the time, there was, there was some worry over whether they would be allowed to build on that land since it was supposed to stay a park. Um, of course, they did keep some of it as a park, and that Cooper Park still does exist today, even though the building itself doesn't. Um, we're going to already get back to the flood. So in 1913, the, the great library was badly damaged. This is just a, a shot of some of the devastation that, that hit it um, during that flood. Um, and after that damage, um, the library also ran into an unfortunate circumstance of Dayton's rapid growth at the time. And Dayton needed a larger central library facility due to the huge boom in population it was experiencing. Um, so when that new library was built, it was directly adjacent to this one. And um, unfortunately for, for those uh, lovers of, of old architecture and preservation, uh, this one was demolished in 1962. Sure. Yes. Do you know who the statue is there? The yeah, so I believe that's the William McKinley statue that, that is still um, behind the, the current library. So that's another little piece that, that has survived to this day. 
So we'll, we'll move on a little bit, and here's where I'll tell you a little bit about um, myself and kind of what sparked my interest in this research originally. Uh, this is a picture of um, kind of plain looking apartment building called the Dayton Towers. Uh, that's where I lived when I first moved to Dayton in, 19, in uh, 2013, not going too far back. Uh, 2013 is when I took my job at Sinclair and, and began um, working as a librarian there, moved to Dayton without a whole lot of knowledge about it and its history. And one of the first things that sparked my interest was this building and where I lived. So I was right next to the Oregon District, which I could immediately see was both kind of the cool place to go hang out, but also the place with um, the coolest kind of well-preserved architecture in the commercial district and the houses. So it was, it was a very cool neighborhood. And then on the other side of my building was St. Anne's Hill, which was another very um, historic and well-preserved neighborhood of its own. So my natural curiosity was, you know, what happened to this space in the middle uh, where I lived in this very modern looking tall apartment building with just wide open empty grassy spaces on both sides. And as I started to sort of research the history of this particular space, um, I learned that, now oh, this isn't working, let's do this. There we go. So I learned that there was a, another neighborhood that had vanished um, that used to connect those two areas. So the Haymarket was what it was called, and that was another um, old, very dense um, neighborhood that had a, a whole lot of different things packed into its very small size. You can see it's kind of an odd shape. Um, it had a very irregular street grid, and just in that small area there was a brass foundry, a horse collar factory, and a candy factory, as well as Dayton's main red light district. So they definitely packed a lot into that small space. Um, but um, as I was kind of interested in you know, seeing or learning more about that old neighborhood, I came across something that happens for a lot of areas around town, is that there's not really very good documentation, as in lots of photos or um, really anything that gives you a, a good sense of what those areas had looked like um, previous to them vanishing. So this kind of led me to one of my favorite research tools that I use quite a bit. Uh, and that's called the Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps, which is kind of a dry sounding name, um, but it really is an incredible research tool and something that's really helped me um, with my research kind of um, retracing, kind of going back into the past and recreating some of these old spaces that are no longer there. So just to, to give a little bit of info on this tool, um, the original purpose was for fire insurance companies to assess their liability uh, in different U.S. cities. But in order to do that, they produced these extremely detailed maps of um, not only the streets and where the buildings were located, but incredible detail on those buildings. Um, so everything from how many stories they were to what materials they were constructed from, um, even like where the windows were. So as far as um, their original purpose, they, they served that well, but in the ensuing years, they've kind of become um, often the, the best way for, for historians or researchers or just people interested in tracing um, you know, an old street they lived on. Uh, really, uh, in many cases, the best or only way to do that. So I'll just kind of give a brief look at um, what the modern day situation is in that Haymarket neighborhood. So if you can sort of see um, what was on this slide as far as the little rectangles. Um, Maybe a little hard to see, and I do zoom in on a future slide so you can see, but basically every little shape here is a house or commercial building. Um, and then today, the Dayton Towers apartments where I lived uh, took up you know, probably at least seven streets, just you know, vanished off the map. Um, the very large and wide Kiwi Street, which is you know, not super pedestrian friendly, which I, I knew firsthand, um, kind of went right through the middle. The post office is right above Fifth Street. So just huge, um, huge losses as far as those houses and even those streets that, that are no longer there. Um, I said I would zoom in, so this red circle here, um, I'll give you a sense of, a little bit more of a sense of level of detail you can get in these Sanborn maps. So you can see the addresses are there. Um, a lot of things are labeled, so you can see there's a coal yard up here, the drugstore on the corner, an undertaker's office over here, so you can see um, some of that diversity of, of building use um, at work there. 
You may have seen Bomberger Park in the last slide. So that is um, a park that's always been there, but in um, years past, before urban renewal, it looked something like this. So it was a beautiful park with um, very distinctive architecture, columns, um, but very importantly, it was, as you can see, really the dense or the anchor of a very dense urban neighborhood. And to give a contemporary view of that same space, you can see the park is still there, but um, the whole rest of it has, has been just totally um, bulldozed and wiped off the map. So there's some of that green space. There's the apartment building where I lived. Um, so at that point, I was starting to kind of wonder um, what, what we'd done with, <laughs> with our neighborhoods. Um, going to do another before and after. So this is the other side of that Haymarket neighborhood. This is the intersection of Fifth and Wayne. So anyone here like the Dublin pub? One in the back, a few others. So I do too, um, but I think I'd like it even better if it was in the ground floor of that building, which is the exact same corner. And this one is, again, kind of hard to believe the, the change. Um, you can see the road has been widened. Um, all the, all the buildings, obviously, have, have been raised to the ground. Um, I think, talking, going back to when I was speaking about the Oregon District and how that's really undoubtedly the kind of premier little district in Dayton for um, nightlife, restaurants, eclectic little shops. Um, if you continue down Fifth Street, where now it's just kind of a grassy area and a couple you know, 1950s or 60s buildings, it was really a... a exact copy of the same type of architecture just going um, endlessly uh, down that way and then also Wayne Ave was pretty much the same too which most of that is lost as well. Andrew can I, there was a church shown now, was that church still there with the time that they go back, that church, is that, was that there at the time? Yeah so so that um, Holy Trinity is I think just from the angle we can't see the um, steeple there but yeah that is still there so that's really the one structure that survived that Haymarket um, urban renewal project. So you'll you'll often see that is the case where if there's one building that you know was spared at the time, it, it probably was a church. So that one is still there, um, right off of Fifth Street. So at that point, um, I became you know, very interested in this this loss, uh, not just of this neighborhood, but I was already starting to sort of get whiffs of, of other areas of town that had seen you know, major urban renewal. Obviously those, those issues and, and the fact that Dayton had you know, bulldozed those neighborhoods was nothing unique to Dayton. It, it was something that you know, all major US cities were dealing with when um, suburban populations were growing, downtowns were, were emptying out, and they had to resort to you know, drastic solutions to, to try to you know, make sense of it all. So for this particular example, um, the, the planned clearance, um, began being envisioned all the way back in the 1930s when there was a housing study which showed that the area was substandard. So we're already getting into some of the rather subjective language that was used to kind of justify these, these huge projects. So at the time, um, there was a plan to clear all the structures and replace them with garden apartments. That didn't happen, but then later in the 1950s, much more federal funding was suddenly um, available to do these types of huge urban renewal projects, um, which basically meant giving big money to developers to, to tear down these low-income neighborhoods that had been designated as blighted. And then this was, of course, combined with another uh, major trend, which was highway construction. And in many cases, that resulted in um, ramming them right through those same neighborhoods. And often these lower-income areas were um, minority populated, they were um, recent immigrants to, to these cities, you know, working industrial jobs, so basically they were groups that had the least political power to fight back, and you know, that was the neighborhood that was going to be knocked down, um, and there was often very little, well, there may have been a plan, but there was very little ability to resettle those um, residents in comparable areas, so, you know, it certainly was the case that this was a very crowded neighborhood. Um, it probably wasn't impeccably clean, but it was still home for you know hundreds, if not thousands, of people um, in Dayton, and you know it was very self-sufficient and walkable. You know all the areas of employment where people may have just lived a couple streets, just a couple streets over, they could get their daily necessities you know on foot or maybe with a streetcar. Um, so to give just a sense of the language used, this area was called the source of crime, delinquency, and disease comparable to no similar areas in the city. 
So they kind of went all out to make these you know, seem like these, these hellscapes in order to get the federal dollars to uh, knock them down. And you know, there certainly was optimism that, that this new um, construction, you know, the, the modernist um, views that sometimes has been called um, the towers in the park you know, view of architecture. Um, Le Corbusier was, was one of the architects who was kind of a, a you know, visionary for that kind of thing. You know, they, they truly did believe that it would be um, better for people to, to live in these big towers and have better access to nature um, and, you know, not live in these, you know, dense and, and crowded areas. Um, but, of course, kind of what we saw was that, you know, the crime, um, but especially the feelings of kind of emptiness and desolation um, only got worse in the later decades of the 20th century after neighborhoods like this were knocked down in favor of, you know, public housing projects or even, you know, just large apartment towers, as in this case, um, with, you know, just an isolated building surrounded by all this dead space and then these wide, busy, modern roads. Um, there was really much less street life, or as you know, Jane Jacobs would say, there were no eyes on the street. Um, so a lot of unintended consequences from, um, from some of these major projects. So for all, all these reasons, this really small sliver of Lost Dayton is, is an especially fascinating one for me. So another lost area that, that really interests me is on the west side. So to, to get to the, the site where we're looking at this building, we're actually still on the same street, so 5th Street, uh, but now we're on West 5th Street. So we've, we've gone through downtown, crossed the river, now we're on the near west side. And this is in what was once Dayton's main black entertainment district. Um, and this was known as the Nickel, and it was a stretch of West 5th Street that had um, a lot of entertainment, but also just your corner stores, your, your churches, your, your community life. Uh, and this was a building called the Classic Theater which was built in 1926, and it's said to be the first theater that was built, um, owned and operated solely by African Americans, and in this case, uh, the two men were Carl Anderson and Goodrich Giles, who originally hailed from Piqua. And then the next year, an even larger theater, known as the Palace, was built uh, very nearby, also on West 5th Street. And, you know, after, after those were built and, and the rest of the area um, grew, it, it really became a thriving area. So major stars like um, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Count Basie played at these venues. Um, in 1963, there were actually 63 different businesses just on West 5th Street. Um, clubs, corner stores, churches, many were attended by both business owners and residents, which just really gave it a community feel. Um, here it is today, or here's the classic theater as it deteriorated, and then here it is today. So really the entire street has vanished. Um, so like the Haymarket, um, it, it was totally demolished, but there's some, some interesting differences. So in this case, you can see it wasn't replaced by anything, um, and actually um, instead of being a planned renewal that was all done at one time. This instead was a much more gradual deterioration, um, often called demolition by neglect, as the area became increasingly abandoned and um, more and more people, you know, residents left, highway construction is going to come into play. I've got a couple slides on that. Um, so really just a devastating combination of challenges and a much slower, more gradual demise compared to something like the Haymarket, which was all at one time. So. In 1966, uh, a black man was killed in a drive-by shooting, um, also on West 5th Street. So that sparked huge unrest. So I'm sure many of you have read about the riots in 66 and 67. Um, so it was really a tipping point for already alienated residents. So some of the buildings on that stretch of West 5th Street burned down during that uprising. Uh, and then the following years, the area was increasingly abandoned. Um, and in 1960, 95% of Dayton's black population lived in West Dayton. Um, so as less overt housing discrimination existed, um, blacks were able to move to other neighborhoods, which you know, was a positive thing overall. Um, but it also led to um, fewer people living in, in one concentrated area like this. So, so the businesses obviously would suffer a little bit. Um, I think that perhaps even bigger uh, as a factor, and, and I've, I've read a lot of reports of, of people who kind of agree with this view, is that highway construction was an extremely devastating um, 
impact on, on this area and many others around as well. So if you can see where um, my little marker is here, that is West 5th Street, and you can see it actually just ends. So it does not actually continue and cross downtown anymore. You can see Highway 75 cutting, uh, cutting the whole near west side off from downtown. Um, and if we zoom out a little bit, you can see just how much not just 75, but also 35 has kind of carved away um, what used to be a continuous area. So, so in not just this example, but in back in the Haymarket, you know, near inner East Dayton as well with 35 over there, there's the same kind of thing where um, you know, it, huge amounts of, of homes were, were demolished for these massive interchanges and highways. And you know, people who once lived a three block walk from their school now had to cross you know, under a highway or were completely cut off from, from things they used to have easy access to. Um, so just to kind of um, illustrate this, I'm going to go back to my Sanborn Maps tool. So this area I have circled, that's an approximation of the old Sanborn Map of just that little circle. So again, each of these little shapes is a house, so you can just see how many people who could have probably walked up to the stores on West 5th Street in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, um, all these houses were demolished and obviously no one is living uh, in the highway these days. So totally gone as far as foot traffic, you know, tax dollars, and everything like that. And you can see all of those houses are just in that one circle. So you can sort of see like how many would be in this whole thing for all of the highways carving it up. Um, and again, you know, the interstate highway system is, is an amazing thing, you know, we, we do need highways, but I think at the time, this whole idea of cutting them straight through neighborhoods um, was just a very short-sighted idea, and uh, the, the long-term consequences were really not, um, not considered. So next, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit, um, kind of before things get too negative and doom and gloom, and, and I always try to not talk about just things that have been completely bulldozed or lost or, or these you know, things that um, I wish hadn't happened in the past, but I also try to use my research to bring attention to things that are still here. So to me, lost Dayton doesn't just mean totally gone or bulldozed or, or completely vanished, but also things that have been transformed so that in many cases, um, a building or other sites, original use may be forgotten by many people, but it is still there. and in many cases it's either been given new life um, or is perhaps vacant but still uh, still standing and, and has a chance for that new life. Um, so these couple of images are buildings that have not been demolished, so these are contemporary shots. This is just um, two blocks basically north of that West 5th Street district, which we saw in the modern day view is just totally vacant land now. And this is the um, business district on West 3rd Street, so in the, the right Dunbar neighborhood. Um, and this shot over here is another of Dayton area's great museums. So that building is the old Wright Brothers um, printing shop. So that's the Hoover Block building, uh, which was built in 1890. And that is actually a, a big part of the reason why this whole district is still there. So this is a great case of something that um, a lot of hard work and dedication um, by, by preservationists, by, by the city, by private businesses, and in this case, um, some of the, the National Park Service um, opened up that museum when they discovered that the adjacent building, which would be kind of over here on William Street, um, was the old Wright Brothers cycle shop. So that had been forgotten. Um, so that kind of put the wheels in motion to help save this whole district, which at one point was about to be totally leveled, um, like so many others. Um, but it's very well preserved. Um, several small businesses are there. The, anyone hear about the new food hall on um, Third and Williams? So they, they opened what they're saying is Dayton's first food hall um, just across the street from this museum. Um, several restaurants and drinks, coffee. Um, so I do still like to, to share some more positive stories, and I think this is a good one. Uh, over here, the building to the right. Um, is an old Nickelodeon theater, which is a, a rare example to still be surviving in Dayton. So that's a building that's currently vacant, but there's definitely some momentum, hopefully for a redevelopment sometime soon. So to, to quickly return to the theaters before I move on, um, just to, to give them their, uh, their conclusions. So there were efforts to 
um, to save them. So they were put on the National Register of Historic Places, which seems like a good thing and is a good thing, but that doesn't guarantee their safety. Um, they can still uh, just fall down. They can still be demolished on economic hardship grounds if the owner kind of says that there's just no chance. Um, they will be granted uh, demolition rights. So the Classic was demolished in 1991, which was this building, the Palace in 2002, and um, old, uh, old patrons of the theater and, and neighborhood residents uh, really kind of showed how special these buildings were to them by doing something very unusual. They held a public funeral for this theater building, uh, which included a eulogy, and 40 people came and most of them made speeches. So to, you know, one could say you're, you're getting too caught up in these old buildings and, you know, things don't last, but these things really do have um, incredible impacts on people and their memories of, of their childhood or, or their, you know, earlier years. So I thought that was a, an interesting example to kind of show how much these, these areas do matter and, you know, how they, they can't come back if, if we lose them. So I'll skip ahead to my next theme, and who recognizes this shot? Yeah, I heard NCR. So in my research, I, I trace Dayton's legacy as an industrial power, and this was really something that um, initially was a bit surprising to me as a you know, newbie to Dayton in, in 2013 and 14. Um, I obviously knew some about the Wright brothers, um, but just as, as someone who wasn't from the area, I did not really get the extent of you know, how big of a deal Dayton was you know, in its heyday as an industrial leader. So um, it's rich history of innovation, the fact that um, I've seen this, you know, cited quite a bit in the last few years that Dayton was kind of like the original Silicon Valley of the early 1900s. Um, there were more patents per capita here than anywhere else at the time. Um, city's nickname at one point was the City of a Thousand Factories. Um, so obviously NCR was, was probably the most prominent of those factories. Um, so this area, uh, aerial shot shows NCR during its heyday, um, and it was much more than a place to work. Uh, here in Dayton, it, it was just such a vital part of the community, and, and I read so many examples of that, and, and I speak a little bit, or write a little bit about that in my book as well. Um, Can you orient me in that picture? Go back there. Yeah, so I, I kind of... Which is north and which is whatever. Yeah, so, so one clue we have here, this is the old track of the fairgrounds. So north is this way, so downtown would be up here. Um, then we've got Main Street here and Stewart Street going here. And then I, I gave a really short teaser of the after shot there. So that is a shot um, soon after NCR departed Dayton for good in 2009. And the demolition of these factory buildings you know, started much earlier than, than that, of course, you know, the 1970s. Um, that's when several of them came down um, because, you know, as NCR kind of shifted more to um, electronics and, and didn't need the mechanical parts so much anymore and all the thousands of workers who, who had once uh, worked very hard in those factories, um, it just, you know, must have been such a crushing blow to um, a company that had called Dayton home for 150 years to, to just kind of leave it like this. Uh, none of the buildings built during John H. Patterson's lifetime survive today. Um, although U University of Dayton, to its credit, has um, led a lot of the, the rebuilding efforts. So they, of course, occupy the former headquarters of NCR now for the, the Research Institute. And then if you do go down um, Stewart Street here today, um, many of these lots have been filled in um, by new buildings for, for companies and partnerships with, with the university. And they're currently in the process of building a new arts center kind of right on that corner. So don't mean to say that you know, you'll go down the street and see this today, but I think it is just jarring to see uh, basically no trace of NCR at all um, anymore. So to contrast that and to tell a quick story about another um, famous Dayton company with a slightly different fate, uh, here's another aerial. This is more downtown than the other. So does anyone know what company that is? Yeah, so I, I heard a few. So, so I've got a, uh, a knowledgeable audience here. Uh, anyone actually work for those companies? Sometimes I get former Delco workers. Um, so yes, so several people said Delco. So this is an old aerial of uh, Delco's complex, which is downtown in what you call the Webster Station area today. 
Um, and the interesting thing here, uh, so like NCR, you know, Delco is not um, a, a big employer in Dayton. You know, you, you can't work for Delco anymore. But unlike NCR, uh, most of their more important factory buildings do remain. So this is my approximation using Google Earth or Google Maps um, to kind of show you that same location. So you can see some vantage points. So this is the um, moving and storage, the fireproof warehouse. And then this is Delco's first factory, plant number one, um, which is still there right next to the ballpark. So the, the one big building that was knocked down and um, is currently the site of the Dayton Dragons Field, that was Delco's third factory, the, the biggest one. Um, but the, the one that you know, has probably the least to do with, with their, um, their inventions and, and their immediate uh, success in the early um, teens. So the other building that you see here and that is still there is formerly the Mendelssohn's liquidation outlet up until just the last couple of years when that closed. And now if you walk by today, you'll see uh, windows out. Um, you'll see big redevelopment going on. So the, the same developers doing all the other big projects in Water Street are tackling that one, which um, is, I think, I think I read that it's actually bigger than the whole Dayton Arcade when you just see how, how huge that, that factory is. Um, so that's going to be turned into to some sort of a mixed use development. Um, definitely some housing, probably some office space. You know, you could fit a whole city in there. So there's definitely a lot of potential there. Um, but I think it's just interesting to compare the fate of NCR to Delco. And I also think that it's, it's interesting just for considering the, the type of architecture and the type of historical significance that we get. So, so Delco is, is a huge name, and I'm sure you know, most of you uh, might even know more than me about Delco's history, but um, as its major innovation, you know, we're talking the automobile self-starter invented by Charles Kettering, so you know, that's, that's a huge deal, and also something that I think your, your average person may not know was, was done here in Dayton. Um, so that started as a spin-off of NCR with, with Kettering and, and Colonel um, Edward Deeds kind of tinkering around in, in the garage at first. And then when they moved into um, this building, they kind of had it built on spec for their own use for Delco. They had just gotten a, a big order of, I believe, like a thousand starters from Cadillac, and they had uh, no capacity to produce them. So they kind of immediately moved in here. They went from about a dozen workers in like 1910 to thousands just you know, a few years later. So they just exploded into this, this huge thing. So they were really in like all these different buildings, some that were built as their own factories, some that they kind of repurposed other buildings for their use. Um, and it's, it's just an interesting thing to consider the fact that these large industrial buildings you know, often don't get as much respect. They're not as immediately you know, beautiful from the street as an old mansion might be. Um, so they very often get demolished with very little pushback. Or in other cases, they are converted to other uses, but there's very little um, nod to their, their significant history, which I would argue is sometimes more important than any other type of building. Um, yes, question. So is the Delco lofts actually in the old Delco building? Yeah. That so. So that's actually a, a good example of, of, I think, a redevelopment that kind of did have a nod to its history. So you can't see it in this image. You can see it's still vacant here. But um, I guess they haven't updated the, the aerial views um, of that area in a couple of years. But yeah, so the Delco Lofts building was Delco's first factory, uh, plant number one. That's where their headquarters always was. So there's a, there's a space in the building that was Charles Kettering's old office that they've kind of kept and I think it's like a, like a meeting space or something. Uh, now it's got views of the ballpark, which he didn't get to enjoy, obviously, uh, in his years. But um, yeah, so, so it's interesting to compare um, Delco to NCR, but also just industrial architecture and its history to others. Because these buildings really were kind of a pioneering style uh, known as the Daylight Factory, which, which uh, Patterson used for NCR. And it really emerged in the early 1900s as um, you know, distinguishing features being just huge windows that, that allowed abundant natural light to, to fill the spaces and, and ventilation. So earlier factories were, were much more um, you know, unsafe, unsanitary. Um, so these were, were great examples of some really um, pioneering architecture at the time. So I think the fact that we still have Delco's most significant buildings uh, is, is a great thing. And, um, 
definitely something to to be proud of, but but also to advocate for similar structures that you know may still be there, but but don't have a new use yet. Question for you. Yes. I know that NCR buildings were timber buildings. They were made out of big beams and so forth. I remember one this one, a big fire one. Were these steel structures here? Yeah. So I, I believe they're reinforced concrete. So that was emerging. Um, so that was what most of these daylight factory buildings uh, built in the early 1900s were doing. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. A big part of it was to be fireproof, um, specifically. So if you know the, um, the Dayton Motor Car Company District, so the building, um, there's a couple buildings uh, kind of right in the east of the Oregon District over by right across Kiwi Street. There are some other buildings that um, that have similar architecture and are still there too. So one of them was just redeveloped. Um, so you, you can see that in a few different places around Dayton. Um, I'm gonna go to another success story. Um, so this is another that I'm sure is pretty recognizable uh, to many of you, especially this, this view here. Um, so that's the Dayton Arcade. And this is a, something that I do have a chapter about in my book, but if you, if you think about the timeline, the book came out in 2018, so my coverage in the book is a lot of history and a lot of uncertainty, and I hope it happens. <laughs> so of course, by now, we, we do have um, you know, a good, uh, very good development towards, um, towards a new future. So the arcade is, it was far from a done deal when I published the book, but it's, it's a massive um, building complex. They now really define it as nine separate buildings, basically spanning a whole city block, and the core of those buildings dates back to 1904, so everything we see here. Um, the, the bottom left shot is the central rotunda, which was called the crown jewel of the whole complex. Um, it originally housed a market house, and today is open as both a private event space, and they hold uh, market days and, and other special events with, with um, you know, lots of vendors and, and other cool things there. Um, so it had been vacant since the early 90s, and I toured the arcade in 2017. So right as I was in the process of writing the book, uh, this was what it looked like at the time. Um, so at the time, you know, doing that tour, I was really struck with kind of a combination of emotions. Obviously, um, I could see the beauty of the space and, and how amazing it could be if, if someone were to redevelop it. But at the same time, um, I was also struck by how bad of shape it was in and, and how just massively difficult any project would be. So I sort of understood why it had taken, you know, 30, 30 some years to, to get it off the ground. Um, so the, the Third Street facade is, is one of the, the best features of the arcade. So it was designed um, to be patterned after a guild hall in Amsterdam, uh, which gives it kind of that unique look. So it's something um, very unique to Dayton, but also something you wouldn't see in, in a whole lot of you know, cities of, of Dayton size or Midwest cities. Um, here's now a shot of the restored rotunda. So they, they did an incredible job on all the architectural details. There's, there's like these turkeys and, and other <laughs> carvings up there that, that are just fantastic and um, very, very well preserved um, in the restoration. So one thing that really struck me about researching the arcade um, that I'll just quickly talk about is that um, in, in many cases you get kind of a story where the narrative basically goes it's this beautiful building or complex um, it was very popular when it opened in the early 1900s it kind of gradually declined you know suburban flight all that eventually vacant then it got demolished or it's still here um, but the arcade didn't really follow that trajectory at all so I mentioned that it opened in 1904 um, so what happened nine years later after that? Flood. Yeah, so going back to my common theme of the flood. So, so it hadn't even been open a decade, and this beautiful shopping center, kind of um, you know, apartments and, and stores and restaurants um, was underwater and, and suffered great damage just like all of downtown. So it was a huge blow to the arcade, and the blow wasn't just physical um, damage and, and you know, floods, but a lot of it was the residential patterns of downtown. So many of the wealthy Daytonians of that era uh, decided to move to higher ground. So in those cases, that meant leaving mansions that were on Monument Ave or old Robert Boulevard or, or areas that um, were, were near the river downtown. And many of those people packed their bags and moved to Dayton View or Oakwood 
um, areas that were starting to, to develop at the time and become sort of the trendy um, streetcar suburbs of the day. So, so the arcade not only had to suffer all that damage, but also a huge loss of some of its you know, most dedicated customers. Uh, but it, of course, rebounded. Um, but then World War II happened, and according to what I read, the rotunda was painted over in black because of the fear of air raids that, that were happening at the time. So there, it was, you know, obviously a world war, you know, leads to, to certain precautions, but um, they said that uh, all the beauty of the arcade was gone, and it, it stayed that way for several years. Um, but always, you know, loyal customers did help keep the arcade afloat, um, but then after, you know, the rotunda came back, the um, coverings were taken off, then that was really the era when the suburban shopping mall started to come up. So, so the arcade just you know, never really had a sustained period without a, a huge setback or threat. Um, so in the 1980s, the early 80s, there was its you know, big renovation then, and it certainly had some success, but that success was really limited to its food court, um, which was very popular, but the apartments never reopened as had been planned in the 80s. Uh, retail was, was a struggle outside of the restaurants, so it was, it was a popular place for, for you know, downtown workers having lunch, but um, the rest of it kind of just never came back quite how they were hoping. Um, so then it closed uh, for good in 1991, and I'll just show a couple more pictures, of course, of the incredible, um, not only just the, the adaptive reuse project they did, but just the creativity and dedication and raising funds. So this, this was a project, I don't even remember the final total, but you know, upwards of $100 million or something like that. And so much of it came from um, different sources like state historic tax credits, you know, federal uh, programs, energy efficient credits, credits on some of the housing units. So the development team um, kind of pulled out all the stops, and I think without, um, without that great work, you know, we'd be looking at a um, big hole in the ground in the center of downtown instead of this beautiful arcade. Um, so there's an interior shot from around that same um, you know, 2017 time frame. That same area now has been turned into classrooms. So I, I should mention that the, the anchor tenants of the new reopened arcade uh, are the University of Dayton and the Entrepreneurs Center. So they have sort of a hub for innovation where there's classes. Um, I mentioned I work at Sinclair, so Sinclair has, has some space at the arcade where they have some of their um, small business and entrepreneurship classes. So it's really a place where, where students are, are learning and their uh, small business uh, owners are kind of you know, getting their start there in the arcade. So I think it's, it's a very sustainable model as opposed to going just on retail or things that have failed in the past. Um, there are, of course, a lot of people living in apartments in the commercial building, which I'll skip back a few slides. Um, that's this one down at the corner of 4th and Ludlow. So that's fully occupied. The 4th Street and Ludlow buildings here are apartments that are, that are pretty full, too, from what I understand. And then the Lindsay building, the really narrow one on Main Street, is also apartments that have opened. So the second phase of the arcade is going to include this 3rd Street facade and some of the rest of the buildings, and that's intended to bring in a lot more in terms of retail and restaurant uses. Um, there's a coffee shop going in, there's already an art gallery in the space, the, the contemporary uh, modern art, uh, that's located there. So the arcade is another of our big success stories. And I'm going to close with one last building, and this is another one that seems to be on the right track. Um, I have a chapter on it in my book, and. Um, I can say we've made positive progress, I think, since 2018 and how I left it in my book. But that's the Center City Building, which um, I would call is, is my favorite in Dayton just for its unique look. Um, but it does not look uh, the same way that it originally did. So, so this is what it looked like in the 1850s, that same corner. Um, so it was originally called the United Brethren Building, and that's for the United Brethren Publishing House, um, which moved to Dayton in um, 1830s, built this uh, four-story building to, to you know, do their publishing, which um, included religious and devotional books and periodicals. So they grew into a really successful operation. And the reason it's kind of historically significant for Dayton is that um, this particular building is the reason that the Wright family first moved to Dayton. So 
Um, Milton Wright was a minister and then later bishop um, of the Church of the United Brethren, and he moved his family first to Dayton in 1869 because he got a job as the editor of the church newspaper that was called the Religious Telescope. So he moved the family here for that. Um, they, of course, then moved a couple other times um, after that, but then they, of course, came back to Dayton for good. Um, but that was just an interesting connection that, that I haven't seen um, written about a whole lot. Near the end of the um, 19th century, the publishing house was growing, and the, the major, uh, um, major publisher who um, was named William Funk had this larger vision to not only have a building where they would you know, publish these books and periodicals, but to build this huge office tower where they would lease out space to other companies, and then um, the goal was to provide adequate pensions for retired ministers and their families. So they built essentially half of the current Center City building at that time. Um, later, second half came, and then the tower portion was added, and this adjacent building here is actually two manufacturing buildings that dated back to the 1870s that got converted to use uh, as the publishing company. And then there's also a building out on Market Street, which um, was the old market house, which you can see a little bit of here. And then uh, today is the central bus hub. So you can see some of that from, from that central street there as well. Um, so it's uh, 14 stories in 1904, and then this new tower portion um, made it, according to at least one source, the tallest reinforced concrete building in the world when it was completed. Um, I'll say I haven't completely verified that, but someone has said that. Um, and it was certainly up there as far as, um, as in the early 1920s. It was 1924 when this was completed. So it still has the same general look today. Um, and I did get to sneak in there at one point, not uh, with permission. Uh, I, I had a, a connection who was working with one of the potential developers at the time, so I got to go all the way up um, to the top. So there's a penthouse apartment up in the top floor of the tower, um, which I think has the potential to be like the coolest place to live anywhere in the city. So these are a few pictures from there. Um, like the arcade, it's kind of a mix of emotions where you can see the potential, but also see how you know, badly damaged everything has been. Uh, there's definitely been some squatters in there. I kind of carefully cropped this photo to not show all the profanity that had been graffitied right above it. Um, here's a shot, as you can see, just kind of peeling uh, <laughs> plaster on the walls, but a beautiful view um, right beyond. And then here's a view I took sort of out of the side, like looking off that tower, looking south. Um, so you can see the convention center. And then I think an interesting thing to note is when I took that photo, this corner here was just grass. But if you go there today, that's where the new Levitt Pavilion uh, concert venue is. So that's just another, I think, great sign for downtown that, that we're just getting more amenities and things that are going to make redevelopment projects that are as big as the arcade or as big as the Center City building much more viable. So. Um, it's just basically free concerts uh, during the summer months, um, every Thursday through Saturday. So that's happening right here, just across the street from this building. And then another thing that I've read a lot about is that um, modern offices and companies, you know, a lot of the old office buildings in Dayton are not really suitable. Um, the trends are for, you know, open offices and lots of open space and, you know, collaborative, you know, flexible spaces. And this is a view of one of those lower stories in the Center City building. And I think that you know, could be a great you know, loft-style office or apartments or some combination of the two. And I will report that this is just from a couple months ago. So the Center City building has won this, the same figure of $5 million in um, state uh, tax credits. And it's, it's happened before, um, and then the developers have not been able to raise the, the rest of the necessary financing to make the project a go. Um, but people are hoping this time it will be different, and it is the case that the um, arcade development team, the, the partners who did the arcade, also now are acquiring this building, so that's their, their next step. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have even more good news on this building, um, maybe the next time I give a talk. Um, certainly a lot of work still to do. Uh, it's not going to be a cheap uh, project, of course. This is another one that's probably almost as big as the arcade itself, just based on the, the sheer size of the building. 
but I think this is another just great example of, of what I think about lost Dayton. So we kind of started with all the really negative stuff, <laughs> the stuff that's totally gone, the, the neighborhoods, the beautiful buildings, but we kind of end with this, this note of optimism of all these gems that either you know, are in the process of being saved or could be very close and just the, um, the meaning they have to, to local residents, um, the just cool um, aspects of them that can be attractive to Dayton's newer generation. I think Dayton as a city you know, still does have that um, innovative and entrepreneurial spark that you know, made us a power in the first place. So I think we're starting to see more and more examples of that um, at play here with people doing really cool stuff. So I'm really glad to be a part of it. I mentioned I just moved here to work for Sinclair. At the time, I wasn't sure um, how long I would stay, but I think, I think I've been convinced that I'm gonna be a lifer now. So, <laughs> so I'm here and um, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today. So um, here's some sources and I will also mention that in addition to the book, I've, I've kept writing articles, so I have a website um, where I do publish other things on Dayton history, so that's just called DaytonVistas.com. You can either go, go right there, um, follow me on social media, I try to post my articles on Facebook when I have a new one. I also have a little email newsletter that I send out only you know, once every few weeks, if that. Um, so if you're interested in signing up, you can either go there. Or if you're interested, I do have a little sign-up sheet if you want to just give me your email address if you'd like to get some updates uh, on other stuff I'm writing. Um, so that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, and a very interesting talk. So we'll have some questions for Andrew. Oh. Yes. Do they give history tours histor or architectural tours? In Dayton, is that a thing? So, there's there's a few. I, I think there's still room for more. So the, the things I'm at least aware of, and maybe others know of others. Um, I personally um, participated in one for the Downtown Art in the City event just a couple weeks ago. So they've done an architecture tour for that the last two years. Uh, that's just once a year, uh, but that's a good one. That's usually in early August. The other thing that I know um, often gets done is really through the neighborhoods themselves. So each historic neighborhood has an association, and they often do, I know, a lot of holiday home tours, but I know Preservation Dayton, which is another great group that, that I advocate you know, people joining or, or at least kind of keeping up with. Um, they have some walking tours that are self-guided, but they have some on their website. Preservation Dayton is another group that's, that's doing a ton to help save a lot of these buildings, so, so they're a good one to look at. Um, other than that, um, I think there's, there's, not, there's not as many as I think there could be, so maybe that's another thing to, to try to work on. Does anyone else know of other tours that, that go on? Well, yeah. Sinclair College for Lifelong Learning used to have before COVID, of course, okay. before COVID. Uh, they had walking tours through the Oregon District. Okay. And they had walking tours for the, um, oh, what's the, now I've lost it, the, the material on the brick walls, what's that called? Stucco? No. Design. Terracotta. Terracotta. They had a oh. walking tour through the Terracotta okay. district, and uh, <clears throat> they had them, but this has not come back mm -hmm. to Sinclair recently. Gotcha. Hopefully it will, but they've had three or four different walking tours. You know, when I was mm -hmm. when I was new to town, some of you might have known Leon Bay. He, he used to give great tours. Um, I I was able to to go on one of them, which definitely helped spark all my interest, and that was through the libraries. So I'm not sure if the libraries may have anything anymore. I I don't know if they do walking tours, but they definitely do like history presentations. But. Andrew, the, the the history of Dayton, the building is very complex, interactive. But in, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Dayton was a donut. The, the interior was basically, and everything was around growing, kind of. And so there seems to be this sort of reversal, although, you know, people moving back to urban center city apartments, there's still a dearth of, 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 of shopping, shopping centers that were there that had not come back, right? I mean, they're not really equivalent kinds of shopping center downtown that people could get their groceries from, for example. Yeah, I, I think that's true. There's a lot of things going on. I, I think the strategy largely has been you know, 
focus on, on the housing and, and those things will follow. Um, so I think if you look at the housing units that have opened downtown in the last five years or, or even 10 or 15, you'll, you'll see a huge increase. So you're starting to see, I think, more smaller shops. So I know right on 3rd Street, actually, there's a new place called Tony and Pete's that just opened up, which is not a full service grocery, but it's just kind of like a little, almost like a little corner store kind of thing. So I think we're still maybe a little bit of a ways away from, you know, getting a place like Reich's, you know, downtown or something like that. But I think we're starting to see the, the smaller shops. And I, I also think that places like the Arcade um, and, you know, other like entrepreneurial ventures that are happening are really doing a ton to sort of take people with, with good ideas, but maybe not all the business, you know, support they might need to, to grow their businesses. And I think that is happening. So I think we are seeing more and more... Um, small little firms that are starting up downtown and then are kind of expanding and maybe moving into an un unoccupied space. So I think, yeah, it's a gradual process. And, you know, there's certainly a, a movement of people moving back to, to inner city neighborhoods and downtowns, but there's still a lot of people who, who still are moving the other way. So I mean, one of the big problems stuff. In, in Dayton in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, where did you park? Because mm -hmm. there wasn't much parking structure. Yeah. And if you, you know, and it wasn't really that if you lived in the outer area to get in. So it decreased the attractiveness of going to Dayton. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were, Sears Roebuck had a huge, their headquarters store was on, yeah. you know, right off Maine or something, and all that's gone you know, for decades. But, you know, it is interesting to see that's coming back and, and changing. Any other questions that we have? For, oh, one more. Have you or anyone else that you know of done a study of who is actually living in these redeveloped apartments and lofts and so on and so forth? You know, are they, I mean, are they people who are going to be there for six months or a year and then launch off somewhere else? Or are the people who are actually going to be there and raise families there and all the rest of that? that that's a good question. And, and I do think it's, you know, in many cases, it is kind of targeted towards, you know, the young professional set. Um, I, I don't think you're seeing as many families there. Um, and I think the other thing that, that, that is relevant here, too, is that a lot of those apartments opening up in you know, the Delco lofts, you know, they're not that affordable. So there's, there's a huge, you know, huge percentage of Daytonians who are, are being left out of, of this kind of renaissance of downtown. So I think as a part of that process, we need to you know, have a really concerted effort to, to have more housing of all types, you know, not maybe right there in the center of downtown, but in some of those uh, inner ring neighborhoods, like you said, you know, to kind of combat that donut shape of, of abandonment. And I think we're seeing some of that, but, but you're right. It, it may not be um, people who are gonna be here for that long. I, I will say that there has been tons of demand and, and many people were kind of questioning whether those apartments would even fill up at all. So, so they certainly are, but you're right that it may not be I mean, I mean, one, uh, one everyone who's gonna stick Empty around. nesters. The, yeah, the that's right. That's the other big population for sure. Yeah, because that, it, you can, can live there without having that. But let's uh, thank Andrew again for his very interesting simulate presentation. He <laughs> has brought copies of his book. Yes. It's a very interesting read. And, uh, and, and check out his website.